is not easy. Hey, Gerald. Yeah? I'm sorry. I've, got a, I've got a surprise for you. <laughs> I'm trying to read that. <laughs> okay. I have a surprise for you. What is it? Real. Oh, that was your life. <laughs> Yay, what is it? <laughs> well, the surprise is the surprise. Oh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is it big? Oh, yes. <laughs> is it pretty? Oh, so pretty. Can, can we share it? Yes! Oh. I cannot wait. Oh, uh, you're gonna have to. Uh, what? Wait? Why? Well, the surprise is not here yet. So I'll have to wait for it? Yep. <sighs> oh well, if I have to wait, I'll wait. I'm waiting. Waiting is not easy. Piggy, I want to see your surprise now. Well, I'm sorry, Gerald, but you're just going to have to wait. <sighs> I'm done waiting. I do not think your surprise is worth all this waiting. I will not wait anymore. Um, okay, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll wait a little more. Yeah. It'll be worth it. Mm. <laughs> oh, Gerald. Piggy, we have waited too long. It's getting dark, and it's getting darker. Soon we'll not be able to see each other. Soon we'll not be able to see anything. We have wasted the whole day. Well, it, uh... We have waited and waited and waited and waited. And for what? For that. This was worth the wait. It was. Tomorrow morning, I want to show you the surprise. I can't wait. <laughs> Why is waiting so hard? Could anybody relate to what that elephant was going through? Just that constant state of, really? Is it here yet? We're still waiting? It's still going to happen? But, but when? I got to tell you, growing up, I was not the most patient person. And anybody who's been in a meeting with me can say, he's still not that patient. But I wanted to be perfect when I was younger. And it really was a sin that I had to work on extremely intentionally to say, I don't have to be perfect. Matter of fact, I started playing sports when I was really young. And I remember doing the hurdles. I could jump over the hurdle quite well, as you could guess. And so I was instantly good at it. And I thought, well, this is how everything should be. I should instantly be good at it. The problem is it did not come that way when basketball season showed up. Here we get this ball. And I think the ball is actually too large to fit in the rim of that hoop. Because I would throw it, and it would not go into the middle of the net. It would bounce off. It would go everywhere way. Sometimes it didn't even make it to the net. And I said, this is it. I, I can't do it. I'm done. I wasn't perfect. I didn't have the patience to wait and to put in the practice. So I quit. And I got asked more times than you would believe in high school, are you a basketball player? No, I am not. Thanks for asking. I changed my attention to something different. 
I decided, well, maybe music's where I'm going to put my energy and see if I could become the best at that. And I didn't take trombone playing seriously at first, but I did it enough through repetition, through being in class. I actually became okay at it. And I said, well, if I can do that with a trombone, clearly I should be able to play any instrument. So I picked up the baritone and taught myself in an hour. I said, yes, that's what it is, to be perfect instantly. Then I picked up the guitar. Now, I don't know if you know this. When you're playing a brass instrument, it's one note at a time. When you're playing this beast of the devil, no, it's a, a beautiful instrument, but you notice there are six strings on this. To go from one note at a time to six, it took a little bit of practice. And so I remember the first day I tried to teach myself guitar, it did not go very well. I practiced for several hours, my fingers were almost bleeding, and I said, I can't do this anymore. The next day I tried it again, thinking, now I'm going to be as good as those musicians on the radio. I was not. I didn't touch that instrument for another four years because I wanted to be perfect. I didn't want to wait. I wanted it here and now. Can anybody relate to that? Video games are horrible in my life because I want to be perfect. How do you become perfect at something? You have to keep playing it. Now, I have yet to come across the video game that will transform my life or pay me a lot of money to play it. I'm sure they're out there. I haven't found it yet. And so I've concluded I can't do video games because I waste too much time trying to be perfect. And my son loves video games. Hey, Dad, you need to try this new one. Hey, Dad, you need to try this one. Hey, Dad, come play this one with me. And I flat out tell him, no, <laughs> it's not good for me. So then he says, Dad, let's play a board game. I was telling him even this morning, I used to love playing board games with Isaac because I could win. I can't win anymore. <laughs> and they become frustrating. Now, slowly over time, I am learning it's the act of just spending time with him that is important. But nonetheless, it goes to my point, waiting is hard. It is so hard, and especially in discipleship. Because here we're saying, God, we want to be close to you. We want to have this really awesome relationship with you. We want to move mountains. Amen? But it takes time. It takes waiting. It takes intentionality. And one of the things that I learned very early on in my discipleship process was I wasn't a perfect Christian. And I hate to tell you this. Your pastor is still not a perfect Christian. Nobody is. Here's the good news. That's okay. You can look at yourself in the mirror. You can say, I'm not perfect, but that's okay. God still loves you. God still accepts you. But here's the thing. It's not okay to stay where we are. If we've read through the Bible at all, you're going to quickly find out God's constantly challenging us and pushing us and trying to get us to be more who he desires us to be. He loves you. He accepts you right as you are, but he loves you too much to keep you the same. And so we're starting this new sermon series. We had just finished up this one looking at following Jesus or what does it look like to follow Jesus and we got this beautiful picture of saying, okay, this is what a, a Christian is. It's kind of Christianity 101. But now we're going to go more intentional. If Jesus comes to us exactly as we are and disciples us, teaches us, trains us, then there's got to be this idea that there's a Christianity 202. And that's what we're entering into is this time of intentional discipleship. It means it's going to take time, it's going to take practice, it's going to take patience, it's going to take prayer. We can't do it without Jesus' help. As most of you know, we lived in Iowa for a few years. And there's this wonderful museum called the Living, what is it called? Living History Farms. It's right outside of Des Moines, Iowa, and it's based in the 1800s. You go to this museum, and you could see how they farmed, how they lived, what, what a one-room schoolhouse looked like. And I remember sitting in there, and here's this stove at the front of the classroom, 
and the teacher was saying, okay, class, bring your lunch up here. And everybody would bring their lunches by the fire so that it would stay warm at lunchtime. And it was just a, a wonderful experience. But the thing that really stuck in my mind that I enjoyed more than anything was the blacksmith. We went in and we were talking to the blacksmith and he looked at my son Isaac, who I think was about eight or nine at the time, and he said to him, perfect, you're my apprentice, come up here. And so Isaac goes up there and this blacksmith says, your job, because if we were in the 1800s, you would have a job. And of course, my son's eyes just get huge and the blood drains from his face. I'd have to have a job. Yes, you would have a job is to make sure the fire is hot. So the apprentice at that time would bring the wood, put it on the fire, and then there's this huge thing that you'd pull down on. It would blow air into it, getting the coals as hot as they could so that he could take the metal, put it in there, and form it. And he was telling us that the apprentice's job is twofold. Number one, keep the fire going. Number two, watch and wait. Watch and wait. Keep the fire going. And watch and wait. And as he's watching and waiting, his sole job is to take in, to learn from this master so that eventually he can do the same thing. But it would take years of keeping that fire going, watching and waiting. And I think about that poor elephant going, oh, day in and day out. So we're going to look at what does it mean to be intentional disciples that watch and wait for what God is doing in our lives. This first one that we have to hit on, we've talked about it several times over the last year. It's one of these things that cannot be talked about enough. And it's just, it's simple prayer. And it's so simple. All you have to do is, is do it. I think of the Nike commercials when I was growing up. Just do it. There are times when I don't feel like praying. There are times where I have lifted up a prayer and I've been waiting and waiting and waiting for God to answer it. But at the same time, isn't this just the most simple thing? All we have to do is pray. It doesn't have to be elegant. It does not have to be thought out, written out, old English, any of these other things. It's just simply talking to God. Nothing more, nothing less. Just simply, God, I need your help. God, thank you for this day. Praise the Lord. I got a parking spot right in the front. Whatever you want to, you can give it up to your God because he wants to hear it. I've got a daughter who is 10 years old. She is full of energy and not perfect. Did anybody know that about my daughter? <laughs> She's not perfect, and that's okay. But imagine in her life right now, she's constantly needing help, either with getting something down out of the cupboard, opening up something, pouring something, finding her toothbrush, who knows what she needs help with. Could you imagine me as her father if she never came and asked me for help? If all she did was sit in the corner and cry and never once came to me as her father to say, I need help, how would that make me feel? Not good. Maybe even upset. Why are you just sitting there instead of coming to me and asking for help? That's actually the point that Jesus is going to make today in our scriptures. So I want to encourage you, go ahead and open up your Bible. It's going to be Luke 18, 1 through 8. Because the reality is God wants to hear our requests. He wants to hear our prayers. And if we think that it has to be perfect before going to God... We're missing the point. If you have the Faith Life app, it'll even have a nice little button you can push, and it'll take you straight to the passage. If you have one of these things, this is more than a doorstop. This is called a Bible. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, you can find it, Luke 18. You can use your tablets, your phones, whatever works for you. But let's explore this passage for just a moment, because, again, I think there's something beautiful that Jesus has in store for us, because truly... How many of you are like me? I go to God and I think, well, that wasn't a good prayer. <laughs> I've heard that before. Or I say, God, I don't know what to pray for. And the reality is we've got a lot. Let's see what Jesus has to say on this. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them 
that they should always pray and not give up. Well, I could just preach on that right there. Always pray and not give up. How many times have we been like my daughter? I need help, but I don't know where to go. Always pray, Jesus is saying. Do not give up. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, there's going to be waiting. But that's what it is to be an intentional disciple. Praying even when you have to wait. Praying even when you think this is impossible. It's not going to happen. Jesus flat out said, you will move mountains if you have faith. And I look up here at Brown's Mountain, I'm thinking, move that? How? No way. It's impossible. And yet Jesus says, I still want to hear it. Bring it to me. Even when it doesn't look like I'm answering it, even when it looks helpless, because giving that prayer up to Jesus, that's keeping the fire going. That's that waiting and watching and learning from the master. Luke 18, 2, he says, In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. Isn't this a a great judge? Don't you want him part of your system? Doesn't fear God, doesn't care about people. We're not talking about a very good judge here, are we? This is the worst kind of judge. This is the one that listens to your case and then says, I really don't care. I'm hungry. I'm going to go get a sandwich. It's not a good thing. Turn to your neighbor for a moment, and I want you to tell your neighbor one thing that you own that has not come from God. Go ahead. Take a moment. Yeah, that's a trick question, isn't it? Because everything has come from God. Your abilities, your skills, the way you think, your natural talents, the things in this world, everything has come from God. And yet, this judge does not care. This judge is just blowing God off and saying, get out of my way. I'm going to do my own thing. And so here we are in Luke 18.3. There's a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Isn't that a great request? Grant me justice against my adversary. Have you ever prayed that one? Uh, there's this one person that just, they're bothering you. You can't get around it. Work is not working because of this person. Or the home is not homely because of this person. Church isn't godly because of this person. Whatever it is, I am certain every one of you has an adversary. Maybe it's not a physical person. Maybe it's a spiritual thing. Maybe it's a mental block but we all have an adversary of some sort. And we're saying, give me justice, God. Make it right. This is not how you designed it. We want something different. Now, I am going to ask you to turn to your neighbor, whomever it is. I want each of you to take 20 seconds, and I want you to just simply say, what are you waiting for from God? What's that one prayer request that you keep asking God, and it hasn't happened yet? Go ahead, take just 20 seconds each, twist and turn so everybody gets a chance. What's that one request? Who wants to be brave? Who wants to yell it out? What are you waiting for? What does justice look like? Yeah, let's hear it. Sleep. Lord, where is sleep? Yes. What else? COVID to go away. What else? People to be healed from cancer. Yes. What else? Salvation. For a loved one, for a son. Yeah. What else? Potholes to be fixed. <laughs> Give us justice, Lord. 
Does God care about justice? You better believe it. Look at Jeremiah 32, 19. Great are your purposes, mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to the ways of all mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct as their deeds deserve. Isn't that the definition of justice right there? The just judge will say, if you have done something wrong, you will be punished. He doesn't just say, I'll just let it slide. Because we want justice. We like justice. And if something good is going on, don't we want the righteous judge to say, good job. You have deserved this. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, he is the rock. His works are perfect. And all his ways are what? Just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Upright and just is he. But the judge in our story, He's not like this God. The judge in our story is selfish. If a man were to sneak into your house and attack you, and in the process got hurt himself, this judge would say, I really don't care. Will you move on? That's the picture that Jesus is painting here. But then look at what happens in Luke 18, 4. It says, for some time, this widow kept coming to him, but he refused Finally, he said to himself, you know what? I still don't fear God, and I really don't care what people think. Yet, I love it when there's a yet in the Bible. Yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. You know what that sounds like, right? Squeaky wheel. I guess the grease. And that's persistence. But again, what's Jesus' point here? Is he really saying that God is unjust? Well, no. We just read that God is just. We read at the beginning that he's telling his disciples this parable so they persistently come back to prayer, that they are constantly going to prayer. So here's Jesus' point in verse 6. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjudge, unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? This is a contrast to say, if that horrible judge is finally giving in, how much more God, who cry out to him day and night, will not God answer them? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, Jesus says, he will see that they get justice and quickly. That's the type of God that we have. He wants to hear your prayers because God is just, God cares, and God will provide. God knows the answers. He wants us to come and to ask. Just like with my daughter, if something is going on in her life, I want to hear it. I want to be able to help where I can help. This is what it means to be authentically praying to Jesus is to say, I'm giving it to you. I'm bringing this to you because I know that you can handle it. It might not be instant. Jesus' prayers that we lift up to Jesus, he might not answer our prayers the way we want him to. He might not even say yes to it, but he is going to answer it because he knows what we need. The point here is to continuously ask, to bug, to bring it up, to just constantly go and be intentional about lifting up our prayers. Keep coming to the Lord day and night because he wants to be, and don't miss this, he wants to be in relationship with you. Think about that. He wants to be in relationship with you. This is why God took the people out of Egypt. This is why Jesus came. This is why the church still exists to this day. The church is not dead. This is God's bride that he has lifted up and said, you will be my presence in this world. Seeing you here, knowing you're online, you are evidence that God cares and wants relationships. So why do we have to wait? Why isn't it just instant? Now, this is something that churches don't normally tell you. I'm going to give you the inside scoop because you're all mature people. It's testing. Think about that. God's testing you. If you instantly said, God, I need this right now, and he gave it to you right there on the spot, 
would you continue to go back or not? Because how many times when something's wrong, we'll go to God, but when everything's right, do we still go to God? Yeah, I hate to tell you this. There are times in Scripture where God tests us, where he says, I want you to stoke the fire, keep it going, watch and wait. Watch and learn. And it takes time. It's a testing period. Luke 18, 8, that second part says, However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He's just told us, pray, keep praying, keep doing it. But when I come back, am I actually going to find faith? Faith is the same as trust, same as belief. Do we keep asking, trusting, and believing that it's heard even when it's not answered? Even when that time to wait just goes on and on and on. And yet, isn't there beauty in the waiting? Isn't there something just spectacular at the end? Just like in that children's book, they look up and they see all these countless stars. Who put those stars there? It's God. There's beauty in waiting. Could you see the end result? If that character said, uh, here's my surprise and it's still the middle of the day, they see nothing. There's something beautiful about this waiting. It takes time. It does take trust. It takes patience. That's what it is to be an intentional disciple. An accidental disciple goes to God only once or twice, gets their answer, and then is done. An intentional disciple continuously goes back time and time again, asking that one prayer over and over and over. Romans 12, 12 says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. You see, that's it. Plain and simple. The life of a disciple is one that continuously connects back to prayer and back to to God. And it goes beyond just simply praying. It includes intentionally waiting. And it's in that waiting that we see more and more of God. It's in that waiting that we see that God is doing something in us. He is making us dependent on Him. What He's doing is transforming us to have dependence in relationship. That might not sound fun, but at the same time, I can promise you it's something beautiful. Because just like my daughter, I, I want her to come and ask. But could you imagine if all she did was ask? Hey, Dad, I need new clothes. Well, you've got some right there. Hey, Dad, I need a bowl for cereal. It's right there. Hey, Dad, do this. Hey, Dad, do that. At some point, I'm going to say, oh, just do it yourself. <laughs> I mean, isn't that the goal of a parent? We want the child to be raised up in a way that they're not constantly dependent on us for the rest of their life. That's part of maturing. Now, when she was first born, that's all she was, was dependent. I had to change the diapers. I had to feed her. It even got to the point that I had to burp this little human because it didn't know how to burp itself. Now, if I still had to do that, I would not be happy. I can assure you, she knows how to burp by herself now. But God's at work here. You see, he, he is transforming us, but it's different than what you would think. And I, I just love this quote from Martin Luther. He says, really, he's pointing to this balance. He says, pray as if everything depends on God, and then work as if everything depends on you. Do you catch what he's saying there? Throw out all these prayers to God. Be reliant on God, but don't just sit there. God, I want to be a better disciple. Go. And God's going to say, all right, start working. You don't get to just sit there. We don't just give up. We don't just avoid God. Instead, we intentionally go to God, connecting with God, allowing God to transform us, to take on more of who God is. And the real question is, and this is a hard one, don't just throw out a yes, but the answer that I'm looking for is this deep down reflection. My question is, are you willing to give God all of yourself? Because that's what it is to be intentional. 
Are you willing to say, thy will be done and give up your will? So, in other words, become more dependent on him. You see how that's kind of a reversal of what we do with our children? I want them to be more independent. God's doing the opposite. Come be dependent upon me. It's really challenging. I, we're reading through the Bible right now in a year, engaging the Bible in a year. Hopefully this is a good experience for you. It can be a challenging one. That's okay. But I was thinking about the Israelites. They just leave Egypt, and especially in Exodus 16, I love this because they're grumbling against the Lord. Any grumblers against the Lord? <laughs> I've done this. And they're saying, Lord, how dare you take us out of Egypt into the desert just to let us die. There is no water here. And God being God says, you want water? There's water. And the rock splits and the water comes out because that's the type of God we have. And they say, well, that's good, but we're hungry. We want food. It would have been better to stay in Egypt than to come out here and die. And God rolls his eyes. I, I really think that's what God does. And he says, you want food? I'll give you food. Here's quail, so much quail, it's going to come out your nose. There's humor in the Bible. And he says, I'll give you manna. But here's the test. He says, you go collect as much manna as you want, as much as you'll eat. And the scripture says, there is plenty for those that ate a lot and for those that didn't eat a lot. But he says, here's the test. Only collect for one day. Now you would think, here's God's people. They just saw all these wonderful things happening in Egypt. They saw him part the waters and block the Egyptians and just this huge miracle to say, I am your God and you are my people. I am with you. You would think they would say, okay, we can listen to God. Did they? Not so well. There was a group of them that said, I'm just going to collect a little extra just to make sure I don't have to be reliant on God, but I can cover what I need myself. And what happens to the manna the next day? It's spoiled. It's no good. And the people say, uh-oh, maybe we should listen to God. And here's, again, just time and time in the scriptures, he says, you're going to be dependent on me my way. We get to the Sabbath, and God says, go collect a little extra so that you don't have to do it on the Sabbath. Did it work? Yeah. There is food the next day. And this constant dependence on God just goes on and on and on. Exodus 16, 4, the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day, gather enough for that day. And in this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Friends, we do go through times of testing because God wants more for you than where you are today. He is transforming you into the best you. So really, the heart of prayer is to say, I'm going to be more dependent on God tomorrow than I was today. The heart of prayer is wait because there's something beautiful. It's to say, Lord, I trust you more than myself. Lord, I trust you. It's not demanding. It's simply saying, Lord, I give it over to you. And you spend that time. So I've got a real simple thing for you. As you reflect on this passage, as you think about what it means to be in this relationship with God, here's what I have for you. I want you to bug God. That's it. Bug God. That's your homework. Go and bug him. Bring is what the B stands for. Bring all your joys and concerns to God. Uh, simple, complex, whatever they are, just bring them to him. Be present with him. That's what it is to bug God, is to bring the you is to understand that God knows best, and God knows you. He is God, amen? So we can bug him, and he'll do the best with it, including transform us. And the G is simple. Give it to God. Lord, I lay it at your feet. You do what you want to do with it. Bring, understand, and give. 
And then when you're done with that, my challenge for you is this. Repeat. Do it again. Keep bugging God. What's your oldest prayer that just doesn't seem to be answered? That maybe you've even stopped asking for it. This passage that Jesus shares with us simply states, keep bringing it. Keep giving it over to God. 